Okay, uh, so welcome everybody and thank you for coming to the people here in the room. Um, we, as the Rosa Luxemburg uh, Foundation of Thuringia, um, uh, cooperated with our foundation in Berlin to host this event about Indian politics and about the situation after the elections in India because uh, we here in Germany observed... Uh, um, the situation in India and we were uh, expecting that the BJP um, would be going out of this election with a big win and uh, this was what media was also trying to reflect here in, in Germany and um, the results of this uh, elections were kind of uh, surprising and maybe I also was a little positive about this although uh, those results might not be positive at all but um Uh, related to the expectations we had in a, um, prior to the elections, um, we felt like, okay, this um, is an interesting thing to talk about with experts from India. So we invited um, three speakers from India and we are very grateful to greet you here. Uh, my colleague Britta from um, uh, the Delhi office uh, in India will um, introduce the speakers and um, will... Yeah, explain what the event today is about. From my side, uh, this introduction is just a welcome uh, to also to the people uh, on YouTube watching this event later and uh, maybe to give you three, four sentences about why we thought it makes sense to host this here in Thuringia. Um, because uh, we calculate the Indian um, community here in Thuringia around 10,000 people. Most of them will be students. Um, uh, This is a number we can also very easily find out because we can uh, get this information from the universities. Um, and the majority of the Indian community or student community is based in Ilmenau, which is one hour by train south of Erfurt and in the north in Nordhausen. And then it's mm, very likely all around about the same amounts in Jena, Weimar and uh, Erfurt. Um Moreover, uh, we have also a huge Pakistan student community and uh, also Bangladesh, Sri Lanka. So we estimated uh, the um, population of southeastern countries, which are most likely directly affected by these elections in India, around 25,000 people here in Thuringia. And we have um, companies here in Thuringia, um, I think 83 companies are directly cooperating, having uh, businesses in India or are cooperating with Indian companies. So we were hoping to address uh, this community with this um, event and yeah, hopefully uh, um, people will find uh, it interesting to watch it later on YouTube. Thanks a lot from my side for coming and um, now the stage is yours. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, we're glad to be here in, in Erfurt. It's a beautiful city. Um, my name is Britta Peterson. I am um, heading the regional office of the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung in, uh, based in Delhi. We are a South Asia office, so we are covering all of South Asia, but we are mainly working in, in India. And uh, I will run you through the program today. Um, as the comrade already said, that the Indian elections... Uh, are over, and they came out as a bit of a surprise. Um, the Hindu nationalist Bharatiya Janata Party, the BJP of Prime Minister Narendra Modi, did not reach its goal to win an absolute majority of 400 seats in the Indian Parliament. It even failed to reach a, a relative majority and has to govern with uh, coalition partners now. Despite the fact that uh, Modi is back in power, this election has changed the political scene significantly. The opposition is back and it is a relevant force again, which it wasn't over the last uh, 10 years. Nonetheless, India has changed over the past 10 years under the Modi government and especially minorities and particularly Muslims feel sidelined, if not threatened, by Hindu majoritarianism. And um, this is why we are going to focus um, this event um, on uh, the rights of uh, minorities and how they have developed. 
Um, but as well, institutions in India have been changed by the current government, such as the judiciary, the election commission, the media um, have been weakened over the years. And um, it remains to be seen how things will develop uh, now with a new weakened Hindu nationalist government. So these questions we will discuss today with three guests from India, and uh, I'm very happy to introduce you to them. Um, the, the, the event have, will have three parts. Um, the first part will be a reading from the new book of Professor Mujibur Rahman. Um, so we will start with, with that. Um, after that, our other guests, Manjula Pradeep and uh, Prashant Bhushan, um, will come on stage and uh, and and uh, we will discuss uh, about the rights of minorities and the, the status of uh, of um, the legal um, institutions and other institutions in India and after that uh, we will be having a, an open discussion here with uh, with you and uh, questions and answers so um without further ado i'd ask uh, mujib to come on stage um let me say a few words about mujib rahman um He is a professor at Jamia Millia Islamia University in Delhi, where he teaches political science. He works mainly on development and identity politics with a special focus on religious minorities. Among his uh, publications are a book called The Rise of Saffron Power, that is about the ascent of, of the BJP. And another book is about communalism in post-colonial India. He studied um, in Austin, Texas, in Heidelberg, which is why he speaks some German, and also at the IIT in Delhi. So, welcome, Mujib, and uh, I'd ask you to read a bit from your book. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Britta, for the introduction, and uh, thank you, uh, the Turingan. Uh, Well, yeah, Turing and Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung for organizing this event. And uh, it's a beautiful city. We just had a walk around and had seen some of the important sites the city has. So I've been asked to read from my book. Uh, this book is the title of this book is called Sikwai Hind, the Political Future of Indian Muslims. Ever since the rise of Hindu right, specifically Bharatiya Janata Party in Indian politics, since 19, late 1980s onwards, uh, there has been concerns about BJP's position with respect to Muslims, but those concerns have intensified in recent years, especially since 2014, with the arrival of Mr. Narendra Modi as the Prime Minister of India. The issue, there has always been in the past issues concerning Hindus and Muslims, but ever since 2014, There has been a global concerns with respect to the violations of rights of Indian minorities, more specifically Muslims and Christians. So this book is uh, builds up a critical narrative about what has happened and what likely to happen with regard to Muslims. And uh, the subtitle of this book basically is the theme of the book, where it argues that there has always been concerns and discussions and debate with respect to the economic conditions of Muslims cultural questions of Muslims or cultural identities or issues of Indian Muslims. But what is important is that that Muslims should retain the politically equal status with other citizens of India. Since the rise of BJP, this equal status, politically equal status of Muslims have been questioned and it has been unsettled. And uh, it is in this context, uh, this particular book is written. Most books uh, written on Indian Muslims generally focuses on North India, Uttar Pradesh, Dioband, Aligarh, and all these issues are generally rigged up or analyzed. Uh, the unique feature of this particular book is that, that it also focuses on the Muslims in South. There is a whole chapter devoted to the Muslims in South, particularly of Karnataka, Telangana, Tamil Nadu, and Kerala. What I'm going to do is this from the chapter two. I will read out a couple of paragraphs. Uh, that chapter two of uh, chapter one of this particular volume is called "Indian Muslims' Right to Have Rights and Its Political Context." This phrase "right to have rights" uh, is basically borrowed from the works of Hannah Arendt. 
Indian Muslims are currently living under pervasive fear in an India that is increasingly embracing Hindu majoritarian politics. Finding themselves as targets of lynching, bulldozer justice, frequent riots for trivial or often for no reason and subject to random violence in this new majoritarian state, they have started asking if they have any rights at all as citizens in India. The Indian state's decision to approve the pardon of 11 perpetrators against gang rape victim Bilkis Bano during 2002 Gujarat riots on 15th August 2022 and facilitate their release in one of the is one of the prominent examples that shows that the arc of justice has stopped bending towards fairness for Indian Muslims. In the Supreme Court overturned this decision of the government on 8 January 2024, but the intent of the government is what is central to our analysis. Despite public outcry that the Indian state remained firm on its decision for close to an year and a half speaks volumes of its intent. In this broad scenario, Muslim citizens are experiencing substantial erosion of rights and their right to have rights is constantly challenged. The phrase right to have rights was formulated by German philosopher Hannah Arendt, a phrase of tremendous theoretical and intellectual potential, which needs to be unpacked in order to make sense of what is unfolding in India today. In Origins of Totalitarianism, Aryan Wright wrote, we quote, we become aware of the existence of a right to have rights and bracketed that means to live in a framework where one is judged by one's actions and opinions and a right to belong to some kind of an organized community only when millions of people, only when millions of people emerge who are lost and could not regain their rights because of the new global situation. Uh, <clears throat> political theorist Sela Ben Habib, who teaches at Yale University, analyzes further the phrase right to have rights. It is apparent the word right is deployed twice in this phrase. So Ben Habib asks, is the concept of right being used equivalently in two halves of the phrase? The first use, she says, is addressed to humanity as such and enjoins us to recognize membership in some human group. She further explains that what is involved here is a moral claim to a membership and certain form of treatment compatible with the claim of membership. The second use of the right is in its juridical civil usage and could be described as civil and political rights or as citizens' rights. In this particular usage, according to Ben Habib, there is a triangular relationship between the person who is entitled to rights, others upon whom this obligation creates a duty and the protection of this rights claim and through its enforcement through some established legal organ, most commonly the state and its apparatus. The second use of right is pursued on the prior claim of membership. Therefore, she explains, to have a right when one is already a member of an organized political and legal community means that I have a claim to do or not to do. A, and, and if you have no obligation not to hinder me from doing or not doing A. The second category of rights, according to her, entitles persons to engage or not in course of action and, su and such entitlements create reciprocal obligations. Rights and obligations are correspondent rights. As our correspondent rights discourse takes place among the consociates of a community. Since Indian Muslims are seen as a religious minority, they enjoy minority rights, which is how a whole set of rights were created and embraced in Indian constitution based on the debates in Indian constitution assembly. Given that majoritarian Hindutva polity does not recognize minority rights, it has systematically attacked the rights of Indian Muslims as part of vote bank politics for decades. What is crucial to note is that there is no place for minority rights as such in the overall discourse of rights by Hindutva polity, which considers minority rights as divisive and thus antithetical to majoritarian polity. Additionally, Hindutva polity views Indian Muslims as a historical entity which has with an established record of oppression against Hindu society. That is what is necessary to understand the complex relationship between Indian Muslims and Hindutva polity or Hindu majoritarianism and how its growth has contributed to the changing fortunes of Indian Muslims and is redefining the basic character of Indian democracy. I'll just read one more paragraph. 
In India's liberal democracy, the conventional logic that the separation of powers between executive, legislature and judiciary would protect the rights of average citizens, in this case Indian Muslims, is becoming increasingly non-functional. This is what is giving Indian democracy a body blow, not just to minority rights or the Muslim future. Even distinguished members of Indian judiciary have started throwing up their arms about the efficacy of India's liberal polity, especially its ability to deliver justice. This non-functionality of separation of powers is the moral most crucial reason why Hindu majoritarianism has become the only game in town. Often recognized in the form of decay of institutions, it has deeper roots and predates the arrival of the BJP in national politics. In a rather benign way, Atul Kohli presented empirical evidence for what he described as a growing crisis of governability in the late 1980s. We need to take a pause before we put all the blame on Hindu right political forces to make sense of how and what led to such a dangerous turn. If you look at the emergency of 1975 to 77 as an aberration and turn a blind eye to the phenomenon of decay of institutions prior to and after the emergency, we may not, we may not go very far in making sense of why Indian voters continue to support Hindu majoritarianism. There is another whole thing about child story here. Yeah, thank you very much, Mujib. Um, we will have the chance to discuss uh, about this later. I would like to ask uh, the other two speakers now on, on the stage, uh, Manjula Pradeep and Prashant Bhushan, please. Let me introduce you. Um, so next to me is uh, Manjula Pradeep. Um, she is a director of campaigns at the Dalit Human Rights Defenders Network Project. Um, that, is a, that is a project that works mainly for the rights of the former so-called untouchables that are called Dalits in India now. And also um, uh, she also works for the rights of, uh, of the tribal population, the so-called Adivasis. Prior to her engagement in this organization, she was the managing director of an organization called Nafsarjan Trust, a grassroots organization working for Dalit's rights in uh, Gujarat. Um, that is her homestead and is also the homestead of, as, as some of you might know, uh, Prime Minister Modi. Uh, in 2011, Manjula received the Women's Peacemakers Awards from the Joan B. Koch Institute for Peace and Justice in California. To, to my right is Prashant Bushan, who is a senior public interest advocate and human rights activist, quite well known in India for his cases. He regularly fights cases in the Supreme Court of India for the rights of the poor and the marginalized. He is known for his use of the public interest litigation to support cases related to corruption and environmental protection and human rights. He also is a convener for the campaign for judicial accountability and reforms. Let me start with Manjula. Um, we now heard a bit of the situation of Indian Muslims that are about 200 million people in, in India, a, a larger population than, you know, a couple of countries together in Europe. And we also have... Um, a population of over 200 million who are um, former untouchables, Dalits, and also um, Adivasis. So, um, Manjula, you are an activist for Dalits' rights. Could you tell us a bit more about the situation of, of, of Dalits uh, under the current government? And um, also, could you speak a bit about um, the question why um, a large population is still, as this, is still deprived of uh, basic human rights, despite the fact that a Dalit activist, um, Dr. Ambedkar, was one of the fathers of the Indian constitution. Thank you so much. Uh, good evening. Uh, you have asked a very pertinent uh, question and also a concern which impacts, as you said, more than 200 million people in India. Uh, having born in that particular community, I realized that uh, how challenging and difficult it is to fight for your rights. 
and also to talk about freedom of expression and also of uh, discussing issues related to equality. And being a woman from the community, I do know that we have multiple layers of oppression, which I have also faced since my childhood. The point is what uh, Mujibur was talking about that uh, when we are discussing about India and which is also seen as one of the largest democracy in the world, do we all are treated as equal citizens of the country? And I think that's a big question mark there. Uh, like Muslims, uh, the Dalit communities in India also face lots of oppressions. I think we also face caste-based discrimination and inequality. Uh, many times people don't even realize that this is happening in India. Many times people think that uh, India is a very unique country with its beautiful culture. But as you dug upon the country's social realities, you understand that there are people who are treated as impure and defiled. Like the touch of my community people is can make somebody angry. And uh, it's something which uh, really uh, bothers me. Uh, and it also shakes the entire uh, spectrum around Constitution of India, which was drafted by the, uh, the most... Uh, well-read and highly educated person from my community, Dr. Bhimra or Ambedkar. And so usually when we meet people, we say, Jai Bhim. And that's how we admire his work and his contribution for the rights of people in India and globally as well. I would say that uh, uh, the right-wing politics has impacted uh, the Dalits as much as the Muslims. And we do know that there are Dalit Muslims as well in India. And uh, I think the most important aspect is being uh, born in the country and we are born as equal citizens of the country. But are we born free? Are we also have the right to speak out? And I think the oppression starts from uh, your childhood when you go to the schools. So the point is when right-wing politics play into that uh, game within the educational institutions, how does it manifest into what kind of teachings you are giving to the children? On one side, the teacher don't allow to sit with other students. I have witnessed myself where the students have been forced to clean toilets and the classrooms. Then they are seated separately during the midday meals. Uh, what would they take back to their homes? Uh, what does education mean to them? And I think uh, the saturnization of even the curriculum and the textbooks itself also manifests that the students, they somehow believe that we are born as untouchables and this is our duty to serve the other people in the country. Maybe you, if you, you could explain a little bit more what is the saffronization of the school books. People might, might not know that. See, uh, how do you teach students about um, constitution? Because there's no nothing about constitution being taught in the school. But it's also like, I would say that when you... When you are in the school, you are not only a student from one particular community. So you are from different castes. India has more than 6,000 castes. And if you go further into that, there are 25,000 subcastes. But then you also have religious minorities, not only Muslims, but Christians and other communities, as well as the scheduled tribes, the, the Adivasis. So now what has happened in the school is, when the prayers are being Asked, and like when the students have been asked to pray, you have to pray to a Hindu god or goddess. Now there is an idol of Saraswati, which is put in the public schools run by the government. The goddess of education. The goddess of education, which I don't believe because I think for me the goddess of I don't believe in gods and goddesses. Unfortunately, for many people it would be a setback, but I believe that. Uh, the person who really molded the lives of uh, Indian women was Savitri Bhai Phule, who is not even uh, been uh, taught in the schools, right? 
So back to what I was, I wanted to tell you was the prayers, as I said. I think one is if you are, if you don't want to pray to that particular god or goddess, you cannot be forced to do that, right? How do, how can somebody impose that on you? But that's what government school do that. The other thing is also that, you know, in the midday meal programs, uh, they have stopped serving eggs, boiled eggs. Because boiled eggs has a lot of proteins, right? Eggs have. So because the dominant caste students might feel uh, not comfortable to eat uh, with those students who eat non-vegetarian food, which in like, I don't know whether egg is seen as a non-vegetarian food, but, you know, in Gujarat, they stopped uh, serving uh, eggs. The other thing... One and might need to add that... Um, uh, the midday meals are a very important um, measure in so, so. in India. They are they are basically uh, giving uh, lunch to all the students in the government school, which is uh, very important, especially for poor students because they are, at least they are getting one nutritious meal. That's true. Yeah, Thank you. just as an explanation for those who do not know yeah. this here in Germany. Even the teachers who are appointed, they have they are uh, uh, groomed by the educational department in the state of what to teach. And they all are from the right-wing groups. And this is happening for last, like in Gujarat, I would say since 2002, when there was communal genocide, more than 1,000 Muslims were killed, right? I was one of the camp leader. I was working in the relief camp. I was quite young that time. And it was not easy for me to understand that this could happen in the state which calls about development. I think the right-wing politics somewhere has diverted the attention of uh, people from social economic development. Uh, instead of that, they have taken it towards uh, uh, making India a Hindu nation. And where the entire issue of rights of minorities and those who have been discriminated because of their social identities as former untouchables, the Dalits or the Adivasis who, are, who have been living in the forest and they are also being pushed out of from the forest. They are also being told that like the Adivasis and the tribals, they had their own culture. They had their own uh, way of uh, worshipping the nature. But now majority of them are Hindus. And those, uh, at one time, I remember there were, they were uh, there were a lot of uh, Adivasis who have also converted as Christians uh, because they wanted better education and better living. Uh, then there was a time when they were forced to convert back to, like I don't know whether they were Hindus because as I said that uh, they worship nature. So there are a lot of things, uh, social realities, I would say. For me, being a human rights activist and a lawyer and heading a very big organization, I've handled several cases of injustice, uh, which includes police atrocities, killings of Dalit youth by police using AK-47 without any reason. Uh, the case of four Dalit youth who were uh, skinning a dead cow and they were targeted and being said that you have killed a cow. As you know, that uh, uh, there has been a law now coming, which has been there for several, in certain states to ban cow slaughter. So in this case, a place called Una, which is going to finish eight years of the incident on 11 July. This incident happened on 11 July 2016. Um, these four youth, uh, they were uh, attacked by 42 cow vigilantes who have been supported by the state's administration. Uh, they were attacked with sticks and batons, police batons, and then they were pushed into a SUV, uh, which was owned, which is owned by a uh, president of uh, Shiv Sena, which is very prominent in Maharashtra. And then they were taken to the town called Una. There they were stripped half naked. One of the boys was a minor, 16-year-old. And then they were forced to walk on the street of Una town 
and they were badly beaten brutally injured and then they were put in, into the police lockup i don't know what crime they had committed i was at the united nations and i saw the video which was viral as you know what happened in manipur where two kuki women the tribal women who were uh, stripped naked because of the manipur conflict between meite and kuki community and one of the women is 19 year old i met them last year last month and then they were stri- then they her father and brother the younger woman tried to uh, uh, save the girl and uh, they both were killed by the mob she is in a very bad mental condition nobody is taking care of her counseling i don't know what's going to happen in india i am really bothered about it in the una case which is finishing 8 years we are still hoping for justice i do know that there are very few people uh, who really uh, uh, work for the rights of people who, who whose rights have been violated and i am i have totally supported that uh, case i have i've been helping several survivors of violence and victims of violence i have survived sexual violence at the age of 4 so i mean what does it mean to be a survivor the point is where do you get the hope of justice there are so many laws in india very good laws they look good on paper now as uh, as we know that there have been amendment into the a lot not the amendment as well but new laws have come up now three more laws um uh, but it it looks like uh, india has uh, a very literate society but that literacy and the education doesn't mean that your mindset is different than before what it was since the origin of the caste system which was there for last 3000 years i think these are certain questions which have we are been raising i remember when i started doing this work my father was a government officer he he had just retired and he was upset about me working on this issue as a activist and they asked me to leave the house and i have been living myself for last yeah more than 30 years the point is is uh what comes out in mujibur's book itself manifests that there's so much uh to be uh to be think thought think about because i think the discussions which have to come out the narratives which have to be shared not many people have the opportunity or not many people would like to speak out what we are talking about because they are afraid and i think when you when you are afraid uh, your mind doesn't work and when your mind doesn't work then people oppress you and that's what i would say that the work which uh, i think we have been doing in india i do it across the country globally as well is that uh the time has come that you have to question uh not only rule of law because that we talks about it talks about the implementation of the law but i think we have to question about around the politics of where you your mind is diverted to another reality which is fake and which is something very dangerous and which can uh, impact millions of people's lives Uh, including women and girls and i think they become the target of this kind of injustice because um, the kind of uh, torture or oppression the women from minority communities the dalits and adivasi face it's terrible and i think they don't even have the voice and that's what i am trying to do is to give voice to them build their leadership and i think i would stop here uh, in case there are any questions i am happy to okay. thank you thank you very much prashant um yeah can you tell us a bit more about the indian constitution and um what is in it for the minorities in the constitution and why has it been so difficult to enforce it and the second question would be probably um the, the bjp is trying to change the constitution um now that they haven't won a two thirds majority um this attempt um has failed uh, but what was it all about changing the indian constitution thank you rita oh. um so as uh, most of you would know india is uh, governed by a written constitution 
uh, which defines the limits of the powers of the executive and the legislature and also uh, provides for some fundamental rights of citizens which cannot be violated either by the executive or by the legislature. Uh, of course, uh, India is uh, formulated into a democratic country, which means that uh, we have elections every five years in which people have the right to vote and elect uh, members of parliament like here in Germany or uh, members of the state legislatures. So we have a federal system under the constitution. We have states and we have a central federal government and the powers of the states and the central government are also defined under the constitution. The constitution has also created several institutions, most notably the judiciary, who has, which has been tasked with the responsibility of, uh, of uh, protecting fundamental rights, of ensuring that the executive and the legislatures function within the limits of their authority as defined by the constitution, to also ensure that the states and the center also function within the limits of their authority. We also have uh, under the constitution an election commission which is tasked with the job of conducting free and fair elections. We also have created several other institutions such as the Comptroller and Auditor General of India which uh, is supposed to audit all the funds of all the governments and the public authorities. Uh, as I said, the judiciary is the most important institution which has been tasked with the responsibility of protecting fundamental rights and some of the important fundamental rights under the constitution are the right to equality, uh, the right not to be discriminated against on, on ground of race, religion, caste, sex, etc., uh, which in a way also protects the religious minorities. But in addition to that, minorities have also been given some special rights to run their own educational institutions without uh, excessive interference from the state, from the government. Uh, again, since the judiciary is tasked with the job of protecting these rights, what we have seen in recent years, particularly in the last 10 years of the Modi government in India, the BJP Modi government, is a very systematic assault on uh, fundamental rights in general and minority rights in particular. And the assault has been not so much by way of law, although they have also brought a law which discriminates against Muslims, the Citizenship Amendment Act, which provides for giving citizenship to non-Muslim refugees from three countries, from three neighboring countries, Pakistan, Bangladesh and Afghanistan, but doesn't provide the same rights to uh, Muslims. But in general, the assault on minority rights is by way of um, uh, actual brutalizing them, lynching them on the streets, uh, arresting them uh, for no reason at all, uh, <clears throat> ghettoizing them, isolating them, uh, socially boycotting uh, their econom them economically, boycotting them, etc. So it's more in terms of practice than in terms of law. And even there we have seen that the judiciary has failed to come to protect them to a very large extent. Uh, 
uh, we have seen a kind of collapse of the independence of the judiciary, particularly during the Modi regime. And in my view, this has happened for uh, several reasons. One of them is that uh, whenever you have a, a very strong authoritarian, dictatorial government, many judges, they just... Uh, uh, they are not able to gather enough courage to confront such a government and question them about their assault on the rights of people. Another reason is that um, this government, of course this was happening even earlier also, but this government in particular has particularly used the instrument of giving post-retirement jobs to their favorite judges in order to bring judges to do what the government wants them to do. So they have given very critical jobs after their retirement from the judiciary in other institutions like the National Human Rights Commission, the Anti-Corruption Ombudsman, uh, members of parliament, made some of them members of parliament, etc. <clears throat> So this has also been used as an instrument to compromise the independence of judges. But in addition to that, this Modi government has also ensured that uh, independent-minded judges, which are not liked by this government, or judges who are from the Muslim community, do not get appointed to the judiciary at all. And they have done so by... Because in India, the law is that the selection of judges is done by a collegium of five senior judges of the Supreme Court. And the only right of the government is to return the recommendation made by this collegium once back to the collegium if they don't like the recommendation. But thereafter, if the collegium unanimously reiterates that recommendation, the government has no further right not to appoint them. But we have seen that the Modi government has defied that law and has resorted to this practice of not appointing judges which they do not like, even when they are unanimously reiterated by the collegium. So in this way, they have uh, virtually stalled the appointment of independent judges uh, in the judiciary in India. Another method that they have used is a very sinister method, which is to open files on all judges and ask all the investigative agencies like the Income Tax Department, the Enforcement Directorate, the Central Bureau of Investigation, and the local police to try and find out any weakness of that judge or anybody in his close family. And if they find some weakness of that judge, they use that weakness. If that judge has done anything illegal, wrong in his uh, life, or if his children have done anything illegal in their lives, then they use that information to blackmail that judge and make him do whatever they want him to do. As a result of all this, we have seen that the judiciary in India in the last seven, eight years in particular, has failed, largely failed to protect the rights of people in general and the rights of minorities in particular. Now, in this 2024 elections, the Modi government has lost its majority or the BJP has lost its majority and they are now dependent on other allied parties for... Uh, for the government which has come in place. And in that respect, the BJP has been weakened. And I expect that in this current scenario of a weaker government, the judiciary in general in India should become stronger and should become more independent and will probably assert its independence a little more than it has done in the recent past. Um, <clears throat> And we are already seeing some signs of that, but hopefully we will see more signs of that in the time to come because it's only been about four weeks since the elections took place. Um, so far as other institutions are concerned, we saw that 
th- this Modi government has uh, virtually bludgeoned and brought into submission all or almost all of the other independent regulatory institutions, particularly the media, uh, the election commission, the controller and auditor general, the police and investigative agencies, and also to a very large extent, educational institutions, uh, including universities, the university regulatory authority, that is the University Grants Commission, etc. Now, so far as these institutions are concerned, I expect that the media, and we are already seeing some signs of that, that the erstwhile mainstream media, which had been made virtually an instrument of the BJP government's propaganda uh, and essentially an instrument which kowtows to the wishes of the government, that some of that will also probably stand up and become more independent. But so far as other institutions are concerned, they have been packed currently by people who are acolytes of this government and it is unlikely that they will assert their independence unless they are removed. There is already a challenge pending in the Indian Supreme Court against the appointment of the election commissioners and that case is likely to come up for hearing soon and we hope, I can't say, but we hope that the Supreme Court will be more assertive and stronger in that case because the case against their appointment is a very, very strong case because the Supreme Court had earlier ruled that uh, the election commissioners cannot be appointed by the government alone and they have to be appointed by a committee of uh, the Prime Minister, the leader of opposition and the Chief Justice of India. But the government brought a law to override that and again uh, made the government virtually the sole authority to appoint these election commissioners. And in this process, they have appointed two of the three currently serving uh, election commissioners. And of course, the earlier one was already appointed by the government. So we have a completely compromised election commission. We have challenged the appointments of these two who were appointed later. That case will come up for hearing and the Supreme Court will be on test in that, in that case. So that's where the situation stands. We expect and hope that after this 24 elections, things will be much better. Politically, they are already moving in that direction in the sense that even in the last four weeks after the elections, public opinion has further shifted away from the government and in favor of the opposition. And the opposition can be seen to be more assertive today more buoyant, its morale is up and the morale of the BJP is down. So I expect that um, and we hope and expect that in the time to come, things will improve uh, uh, in in many ways in the country. Yeah, thank you very much for this optimist outlook. Um, trying to control institutions such as the judiciary, the media and uh, The, the educational institutions is always part of uh, of um, the agenda of right-wing governments wherever you go. If you go to the US, you go to, you see Poland, you see uh, Hungary, um, you see Italy at the moment, you'll probably see the same in France. Um, but um, coming back to the question of Muslims, um, we also know in Germany and in Europe uh, our own amount of anti-Muslim sentiments. In fact, this week, We had the that on 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 Monday was the day of um, uh, anti-Muslim the the day against anti-Muslim violence, remembering the the killing of a Muslim woman by some right-wing goons. So um, I would like to ask you, Mujib, what is um, what is the special situation of Muslims in India? It is different from the Muslims that have immigrated to to a country like Germany, just like. Uh, some decades ago. Um, can you talk a little bit about the special situation of Muslims and why they are especially targeted by the BJP? 
Well, uh, as I said uh, in that, you know, the Western discourse or the liberal discourse has always looked at Muslims as a religious minority in India. Muslim population, according to the 2011 census, happens to be roughly around 14.2%. It might have come close to 15%. And they are unevenly distributed in different parts of India. In some states, they have a, they have a significant presence. There are states where they are in much smaller in number. So as a result of which, in the democratic or parliamentary politics of India, their representation has become an issue. And in areas where they have a bigger concentration, they do they are seen as a potential player in terms of determining the outcome of elections. Now, uh, Muslim identity in India happens to be what I call in my book is a historically dense identity or a densely historical identity. You know, it is not a religious minority or, or, or minority like the way Indian diaspora is in America. So there are different dimensions of Indian history and Muslims are perceived to be a community that has ruled India for hundreds of years. Uh, the most dominant and distinguishing, distinguished part of it is during the Mughal rule and all of it. And there are things that have happened which are not particularly very pleasant and those things have saved the memory of or uh, are, are some of the things which are uh, used in order to target the present generation of Muslims by the Hindu right groups. So uh, Hindu right groups, that's why I do not look at it as a religious minority. It looks looks at it as part of some kind of an, uh, you know, colonial community, a community that once colonized uh, Hindu community and, had, and now it is time for them to pay a price. So it is a, it looks at it from that point of view fit. So uh, when Prime Minister Modi became the Prime Minister in 2014, uh, in the maiden speech to Indian Parliament, he, he said, he talked about the slavery of India of thousands of years, which obviously because generally the British rule is considered to be a colonial rule, Muslim rule was not seen as a colonial rule in India, in the liberal discourse or progressive discourse of it. Whereas Prime Minister Modi con made a statement in the Parliament of India saying that we were a country, we are a country which had a thousand years of slavery. We have experienced slavery, which included a Muslim rule of Arkansas. So Muslims have seen through that particular lens. And uh, so so all these arguments about Babri Masjid and a lot of other issues which have become very central to the issue of conflict. And uh, there are many more issues concerning that concerning various mosques in Banaras, Gyanvapi Mosque in Banaras and others. They're all part of that kind of an analysis of history. Now, scholars have disagree disagreed with that formulation. There was nothing called a Muslim rule. What we see is this, there are some Muslim families and dynasties which have ruled India during those periods of time. Even Mughal rule was not a Muslim, it was a Mughal dynastic rule. So, it, and those families, the individuals, those who became emperors, they f they also fought with other Muslim kings in order to retain or expand their base. And they also killed each other, their own family members also, to come to power or come to throne, part of it. So that is a very, very general description of it and which had popular, at a popular level that has a consequences. So therefore, historically, you know, so, so historians like Ramila Thapar and others have often argued that uh, that this kind of description of Muslim rule and uh, all these things about it had consequences in terms of perpetuating or spreading communalism and communal consciousness in our society. But fit. So these are all these things about it. So uh, since the Hindu right believes in uh, that 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 this is basically a Hindu India is basically a Hindu country, Muslims and Christians have come from outside, you know. So and they have done some damage, and it's now the time for us to correct all of this. As part of it, so various governments, uh, or the BJP governments, have started renaming streets. You know, many streets which are named after prominent Muslim figure or his Muslim historic figure, those names have been changed. The city's names have changed, uh, and all of that about it. So we come across uh, that kind of, so there is an attempt to rewrite and uh, where he saved the history of India and erase all the senses part of it. So, so it's precisely from that point of view, the, the Hindu right looks at 
Indian Muslims through a lens which is very distinct and it has its own interpretation of history and has not come to the terms of the fact that human beings have got rights regardless of their history, had not come to the fact that world has changed and world has moved towards multiculturalism. Uh, it is a fact that, that, that there is somebody with a Hindu heritage who is now the Prime Minister of Britain and there are many Hindus who have moved to America running for presidential, uh, presidential candidates, various primaries and all of that about of it. So there is all these things uh, that has happened about it. But, uh, you know, there are uh, many Indians of Hindu heritage who are uh, heading major corporate organizations such as Google and Meta and all of that about of it. Hindu right, however, does not look at multiculturalism uh, or, or from the point of view of uh, modern uh, as one of the modern aspirations where everybody treats as equal. So it is kind of fixated, fixated with the history of India and selective interpretations of history of India and the atrocities of some of the Muslim rulers and uh, all of that in part. That is one of the reasons why this conflict uh, uh, is, appears to be so uh, deep and so enduring and is increasingly becoming uh, you know, more and more to uh, put fire into it are the speeches by some of the prominent leaders, including our Prime Minister, as it became quite apparent during during the last election campaign, which is probably the most Islamophobic campaign, uh, election campaign that we have witnessed. Yeah, thank you very much. Before I open the discussion now, I would just like to ask you, all of you, a, a, a last question. We, we heard a lot now about um, a certain ideology um, that is targeting minorities for various reasons. Uh, that is also targeting the existing institutions. Um, at the same time, I think what we heard very often in, in India is that um, many of these minority groups, as well as um, the many people who are working in India in the informal sector, there's still 80% of, of the population is working in the informal sector uh, without um, basic um, the, say, social security, um, that these people probably that were the ones who uh, were responsible for uh, for the defeat of, of, of the BJP, that the BJP suffered, um, because they felt that after 10 years of, of BJP governance, they have gotten very little out of it in order to improve their um, economic situation. Because if you remember when Prime Minister Modi came to power, um, uh, the promise of development was one of the Uh, big issues in his um, campaign. So, um, what do you think? Um, what is more relevant, or is it both equally relevant? The fact that um, the uh, that party didn't deliver, or that also the ideology was seen uh, with skepticism. So, I think it was primarily uh, economic. Primarily economic. Uh, reasons why uh, there was so much disenchantment with the Modi government. There were the youth, unemployed youth, there were people from the informal sector, there were farmers who were uh, shortchanged and uh, promised something and not given anything whatsoever. Uh, <clears throat> there was inflation and the Uh, the sort of uh, bite of poverty on account of inflation, unemployment, etc. So I think those were the primary factors which led to the defeat of the Modi government. But to some extent, I feel that uh, it was also that this whole thrust of uh, Islamophobia and trying to Uh, polarize and divide people on uh, religious lines, which Modi uh, and the BJP had been doing, I think uh, this had reached a saturation point. Because, see, India, I mean, for the BJP to think that uh, India can be easily divided on religious lines is not a correct formulation because, uh, as you know, there are a lot of castes play a very, very important role. And in this election, 
A lot of Dalits uh, voted against this government because they felt that uh, their uh, rights of reservation were under threat because of the Modi government's uh, uh, sort of upper caste ideology. One of the reasons why uh, Dalits have faced more uh, oppression under the Modi government is because uh, the BJP and uh, the Modi uh, uh, people uh, do have uh, much greater upper caste uh, sensibility and they, they, they instinctively treat Dalits as subhuman, just as they instinctively want to treat uh, Muslims as uh, not equal citizens, but they treat Dalits as subhumans. That's their instinct. This is the upper class... Uh, mentality, upper class, upper caste Hindu mentality to a very large extent, which the BJP has. And uh, sure. therefore, for them to feel that they can easily just divide the country on religious lines and get the majority of the Hindu votes is not a correct thinking because, as I said, India is stratified on many ways particularly caste, but also on economic lines. And those people who, who were at the bottom of the economic pyramid were feeling the brunt of uh, the policies of the Modi government, including uh, such uh, ridiculous things like demonetization or uh, bringing this kind of GST and many other things which, which uh, were clearly hitting the poor very hard. So I feel that both the things, uh, but primarily the economic factors, but even uh, there was a saturation of this kind of uh, communal politics. And uh, there is also a saturation of uh, the projection of Modi. People had got tired of that. And, and in fact, they were beginning to revolt that this became a counterproductive strategy of uh, Modi to just project himself and make the government all about himself. So all of this played a role. Thank you. Any, any one of you wants to comment on this or shall we open for discussion? <laughs>